Welcome to this talk titled The Road to Akka Cluster and Beyond. And this sort of shows a little bit of the agenda for this talk. We're first going to focus on the road and the sort of a, the history of the, of the distributed system, sort of its origins, but with a lens, right, what, what I think are important milestones and what have influenced Akka and Akka cluster. And, and uh, so <clears throat> that's sort of the first half or first two thirds, perhaps. And then the, the, the last part, I'm going to like show how we actually use these ideas and use these sort of, yeah, inventions or whatever, so discoveries in practice in Akka and Akka cluster and how we can make it all sort of fit into our model and something that, that you guys can use in the real world. So, <clears throat> but I'm going to start with a question. And what is a distributed system and, 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 why, and why would you need one? <clears throat> I'd say that di distributed computing is not really something that, we, that we, we just can't escape any longer. It's, it's really the new, the new normal. Like it, it, it hits us almost everywhere. If we have, you have a distributed system in almost all, the, probably all applications that, that you develop today, even if you want it or not, right? Mobile devices, I mean, uh, is actually di di distributed systems, right? It had all the problems that you might see or challenges that you might, that might, that you might see, like m devices go offline and, and when they come back online, they need to stink the state back and so on. And like you NoSQL know, databases are usually d distributed to some, to, to some extent, REST, cloud services, and so on. They all, I mean, sort of come with a whole set of challenges, right? And, and, uh, and, and even, not even thinking about the network, I mean, I think in my view, the, the, the way I look at it, I think we have a distributed system even on a single machine now with, with, with multi-core. I mean, either you have, <coughs> nodes separated by the network where messages like tr need to be sent or you have CP, I mean cores se separated by the QPI link where messages need to be sent, like t totally isolated units. If you sort of accept that mental model, I think a lot of things will, will fall into place. That it doesn't matter if the CP, the, you, your, 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 your cores sit in the same processor or actually in different processors on different nodes. The same models apply and the same challenges apply. Not exactly. The latency is, is low. Is, is sort of, it's of course a lot lower, and this, but but a lot of the 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 the, the, the same challenges apply, I think, and, and just accepting that will make things easier. So, what is the essence of distributed computing? It's been said it's try to overcome two things. <clears throat> so, the information travels at the speed at the speed of light, and that becomes really really clear and like hits you right in the face when you have the network because latency will be so much higher. Is something that, that, you, that you just cannot ignore. And the second thing is that, oops, is that independent things will fail independently. I mean, you have, you have a world where, where partial failure is the norm. And that also puts, I mean, puts things in a completely different context. So why would we need it? Yeah, for elasticity, when we outgrow the resources of a single node, well, then we need to add more resources. For availability, if, if, if the node where we're running or the, 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 sorry, the machine that we're running things on fails, we need to be able to, to like c continue servicing our users somewhere else on some other machine. And also, as I said, rich, rich stateful clients, mobile devices and these things that actually, I mean, brings context with them. State, do updates and then comes back online is also really challenging. So what's the problem then? <clears throat> it's just so hard. It's still very, very hard. I think we have evolved quite a lot in the industry. I mean, but still, these things are just really, really hard. And, and some of the things that makes it hard is that the network is inherently unreliable. And that messages, I mean, commu communication can get dropped at any point in time. And that makes it really, 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 really hard. I mean, you know that you can't, in, in a distributed system, you can't tell the difference if, it, if, if, if the node that you're communicating with is just really, really slow right now, is, is, is doing GC, if it's Java or something, or it's just very busy and be maxing out on the CPU, or that he's really dead and will never ever come back again. You can only take like qualified guesses what's the case. So in a way, it's, 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 um, it turns sort of, it's a little bit into an art, right? It's a little black science. You will just take estimated guesses and try to like find your way, in a way. There's usually no, nothing, no, nothing black and white. I don't know, you've, you've probably heard about Peter Deutsch's eight fallacies. I won't, I won't go through them in detail here, but it's really, 
uh, something that I think I, I encourage you to like internalize. All these things are really valid today more than ever. So yeah, it's still really, really hard, I think. And we, 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 we just need to have a way to deal with that. So I'm going to start with, with, with sort of going through some theoretical models that we, that we see today and see, I mean, which, how they fit into this world of distributed systems. And as a help, <coughs> I'm going to use this, this model from, this, from a book by, by a guy called Carl, Carlos Varela. It's a pretty decent book, actually. Um, I reference this in my slides um, at the end, so if you want to like look up all the papers or look up all the stuff I'm talking about later. But it says that a model for, di di for distributed computing should allow explicit reasoning. It should be like first class to reason about concurrency, distribution, and mobility. And concurrency means like computation can happen concurrently. Distribution means that it can happen concurrently in different locations. And mobility means that computations can move to other locations to optimize communication patterns and so on. So, who's this guy, you know? <laughs> Alonso, Church. Alonso Church, yes. So he, he came up with lambda calculus in around 1930. And, and, uh, and I'm gonna, now, for all the three models I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at it from, from the, from, I'll say, I, I stole this idea from Joe Hellerstein, uh, Berkeley professor. To, to, uh, to, uh, talk about it from the perspective of state and, and order, like uh, order being sort of these in the instructions, working on the state. So, so if, if you look at state, I mean, with lambda calculus, you work with immutable state is managed through functional application. It's re referentially tra transparent, and ordering. I mean, the evaluation order can be can be it's usually can be evaluated in in any, in any order. It's used in called beta reduction. Even in, even in parallel, and if, I, if you look at that, I think it's a model that really p supports concurrency very, very well. That's something we see out there a lot. I mean, a lot of functional, you know, sort of c concurrency heavy uh, computations are very easily falls into the sort of these, the, the, in, into the functional model, because it's a very nice model to, to, de to deal with that. But it really doesn't have any model for distri distribution, and really no model for mobility. That's things you can add on top, I guess, but it doesn't have anything like that built in. Second guy, this is John von Neumann. <clears throat> he came up with this, with this sort of von Neumann machine in like 1945. And it's really a model that's sort of designed for the, for the world that it was back then. I mean, a single processor working through, 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 uh, through state. So uh, if, if you look at state, it's really, it's really dependent on mutable state and in-place updates, right? And ordering, you have, it assumes sort of a total ordering of your instructions that, like, that, that sort of update this, this state, this sort of array of memory in sequence, like one by one by one by one by one. So like, it assumes like you have full control over, over, over the integrity of your data. And I don't think this is a really good model for, for concurrence. That's proven to be really, really bad. In order to make it, to, to make it work, we need to add like, things like threads and locks and mutual exclusion to like, try to shoehorn things into the von Neumann world again, even though things look very differently in the, in the, real, in, in the, in the real world, so to speak. It also doesn't have a model for distribution and no model for, mob for mobility, even though this model, the von Neumann architecture, is really what we see out there a lot with some patchwork on top. And I think there are better, fundament, better fundamental models to, 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 to look at. One of them is, is by this guy, Carl Hewitt. So he, in, he came up with, a, with, a, with, a, with the concept of the actor model in 1973. And uh, it was actually through some research in AI that he did. He, he, he came up with the language called Planner. And uh, sort of introduces the ideas of, 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 uh, of actors, of the actor model. And it was later re re refined by a student, Gul Aga, that took it even, even, even further. And I think that it's a great model, actually, for, 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 for concurrency um, and for distribution and for mobility. And, 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 and why? Essentially because the state, it uses like a full share nothing designs. So you have you know, full atomicity within, within the actor, but there's no way for, for any other like, concurrent process to actually t like, tamper with the state, not even knowing what the state of another actor is. It needs, to, it needs to communicate. So communication is also first class. It, it relies on asynchronous message passing. And, and you have, it introduces non-determinism in the message send, but as soon as it reaches its, 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 its recipient, then ordering is there. 
So that, that means that you can reason with things within the actor while still allowing non-determinism, which is a good thing because that allows concurrency and distribution and all these things that we want in, in, in distributed systems. So I think this is a great model for concurrency. This is a great model for distribution. It also supports mobility, not, not, perhaps not like it's part of the model, but since everything is contained within the actor and there's no, no, no shared state, it's actually fairly easy to move actors around, it's something that we do in ACA. So that was sort of so lays out through some of the foundation. And I think that, some people might disagree, but I think that I mean, in, in, with this paper from 1973, I think Carl Hewitt sort of kicked off the distributed systems. And until then, you know, people really did, weren't really, really prepared for, for, for it and really didn't have <clears throat> a way of sort of modeling that, that sort of very different world in any way. <clears throat> Sorry. So, one thing that's sort of, one of the most, the most important things to talk about when, when you talk about di distributed systems is what is called imp impossibility theorems <clears throat> or impossibility results, some, sometimes they are called. They, they, they sort of, they're also sometimes called negative results and they show what is, they, sort of, they prove what is not possible and, by, and by, 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 by showing what is not possible, they in a way sort of give sort of us a glimpse of what is possible. I mean, the way to the, f to like the road ahead, so to speak. And, and uh, probably the most important one, uh, at least, uh, one of the most fundamental one, most cited one at least, is FLP Pager, it's F FLP paper from 1985. It, it's, 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 it's named after its, all, its authors, like Fisher Lynch Patterson. And it essentially states that consensus is impossible, which sounds weird, right? Be consensus is something we take for granted, right? And we do every day and we, we we get along with, 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 with our lives, right? Communicating and sort of agreeing upon, up, up, upon something. But so one way of sort of explaining the, the gist of the paper is that the FLP result shows that in an asynchronous setting where, this, where only one processor might crash, there is no distributed algorithm that solves the, cons the consensus problem. And what it, so what, it, what, it, what, what it really does is that it states that under, under the assumptions of the model, sort of, there are cases, sort of, ways where the algorithm will never terminate, meaning that they will never reach consensus in bounded time. But, but as the author state at the, at the, at the bottom of the paper, uh, that they, they, they write something like, it's actually, it doesn't say that it can solve in practice, in quotes. There's a way, of, like pragmatic way of finding a way around this, this proof. And that's usually what, what, what happens. So that's also, in a way, like showing the way and, and giving us our, some our constraints to, to work with. Nothing is black and white. And another sort of very important imp imp impossibility theorem is the CAP theorem. And it essentially shows that linearizability, linearization on, in, in the cluster is impossible. But it is also impossible within certain constraints, right? It shows is that is like generally impossible. It, it, it introduces this like CAP. C stands for consistency, A for <coughs> availability, and P for partition tolerance. And it states that out of these three you can only pick two at a given point in time. And since on a distributed system we have P already. That means that it gives us just one option. Do we choose consistency or do we choose availability? Right? We can't really get both. And it was, it was a conjecture by Eric Brewer, I think in one of his talks, if I remember correctly. And it was later proven, like two years later, by Nancy Lynch and, and this guy Gilbert. And this is the name of the paper, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great paper. I encourage you to read it. So what is, what, since it proves that linearizability is impossible, what is it? What does that mean? <clears throat> yeah, it was defined by Hurley Wing in 91 as under lin Linearizable, sorry, under linearizable consistency, all operations appear to have executed atomically in an order that is consistent with the global, with the global real-time ordering of operations. And that's a mouthful. What does it really mean? Yeah, if, we, if we try to distill the essence, less formally it means that a read will return the last completed write wherever it happened, wherever in the distributed system it happened, on any replica. Right? And, if you, and if you think of it, this is an extremely strong guarantee. He's also actually, again, trying to shoehorn 
the world into the von Neumann architecture once again, right? Because we are used to think like that, and it's a convenient way to think of the, of the world. But it's very, very expensive. <clears throat> so if you look at CAP, I think it was highly influential, but it was really, really narrow in scope, I think. I mean, Peter Baylis and his, and his, and his group at Berkeley, they, in, in the HAT paper, it's a great paper, by the way, HAT, stands for Highly Available Transactions. Uh, they, they said the cap has led to confusion and misunderstandings regarding replica consistency, transactional isolation, and high availability. And the essence is that linearizability is very often not required. It's, it's such a strong guarantee. And you can very often get away with, weak, with weaker guarantees, like recommitted, for example, and things like that. It also ignores latency, and what latency, as we've already shown in the, talked about in the beginning, is like is one of the, the like the, the properties of, of the distributed system that you, that you just can't can't avoid, right? You, you can't escape. Still, it, it ignores it. And 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 lastly, partitions, even though they happen because the network is unreliable, they are fairly rare. So why should you then sacrifice consistency at all times, right? Why 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 can't we have like a more mold that's are open up for dealing with things we look sort of as we go, right? More, dy more dynamical, we can try, as a sort of a best effort, right? We can try to do, when, when things go fine, we, we, we have consistency, right? But then we fall back to availability when things starting to go wrong, and so on. I'm just asking questions. And a lot of these questions, Eric Brewer asked himself in this, in this sort of paper cap 12 years later, which is a great paper to also talk about. No, actually, read. So, Time. Time is, is really a fundamental construct, right? That's how we all, I mean, work as humans, right? I mean, that's why we all met here at 10 o'clock, to hear me rant about these things. It, time also needs to be first class in, in the programming model for distributed computing. That's how, I mean, we can reach consensus, that's how we can make sense of the, of the world, I really think. And once again, thanks to Leslie Lamport, we, we now have a model for that. He, he, he came out with this paper, Time Clocks and Ordering of Events in Distributed Systems, uh, 1978, where he introduces the concept of, 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 of the Lamport clock. We call it the Lamport clock now. Uh, it's sort of a logical clock, and, and it, it's sort of, the, the, sort of the, the big contribution that it's, 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 it's starting to like show time as, as causally related events, not wall clock time because that's not interesting any longer. You can't even keep, keep like computers in sync, right? Even, perhaps if you have a lot of sort of cash like Google, you can have atomic clocks like they do in Spanner and so on, but it's, it's not really the model for that sort of sustainable, I think. So Lamport clocks works, like, it's basically just a neat, like, 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 like a counter, Like right? When process does work, you increment the counter. When the process sends a message, you include the counter, and when the message is received, then you merge your counter by, by, by just taking the max. It's, it's, very, it's very easy. Then not, now you can like causally sort of relate events to each other, even, even though they happen concurrently on different machines. Vector clocks is an extension of this. It was, it was sort of discovered by Colin Fidge, 88, and, and concurrently was discovered by some other guy that I don't remember the name of, I don't think nobody does, so that's, it's a shame for him, but <laughs> but it, it's a, it's a nice it's a nice concept. It's also what what most I mean, NoSQL databases and like Arca cluster are using today, and it basically gives you I mean in, 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 instead of that each node each sort of party in the conversation has its own Lamport clock, you, you have like a like a hash map you can say with with node two Lamport clock, and this this sort of is is is, is what you then send around. So, so this always keeps the full history of all of everything that have happened, right? And 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 on the receiver side, you again do like do merge by calculating the max. And the interesting thing is that the properties of this is that it's, it, it is monotonically increasing. So it's it's sort of it will always converge eventually. It has some problems though. That is that, for example, since it keeps all the history around, that I mean, the history can can grow in, in de in de indefinitely, and you need a way to prune that. And, but there are good research people, like dotted version vectors, for example, that help you deal help you deal with that. So that's time. Now we have a, a way of modeling time. Another thing that we need to be able to model and, and to understand is failure. Okay, failure is is. A, 
is an extremely important thing. Right? And as I said, there's nothing like black and white. And it, it, it's more of a black science, really, or an art form, really, to, to fully understand it. Because we can never know for sure. We can just take very qualified guesses. And the better guesses, the better uh, we, we, we're off. But as I said, everything has a cost as well. So, so in order to, to, to sort of reason about these things, we need, I think we need to form a formal model for, for thinking about these things. And uh, so we have something called strong completeness. Strong completeness means that every crash process is eventually suspected by every correct process. This means that basically everyone knows that something is, is wrong, right? That's a very, it's a very strong guarantee or strong uh, requirement. Weak completeness says that every crash process is eventually suspected by some correct process. It means that someone knows. And, and for the accuracy, we have strong accuracy. That means that no correct process is suspected ever. And some correct process is never suspected. A sort of strong accuracy, you can say that's like there's no false positives. And weak accuracy, there are some false positives. And ideally, of course, we want to get like everything like should be strong, right? Strong correctness, strong accuracy, then we know for sure, like. But, but, but the thing is that everything has a price, right? And, and, and sometimes we might not be will, want to or be willing to pay the price of, of that. So we need to find the middle ground here something, somewhere. So there are a couple of failure detectors that I, there are lots of papers out there about it. And, and, and a lot of them are interesting. But I'm just going to talk about two here that, that, that I think are very interesting. The first one is the, it's called accrual failure detector. Was, was, it was, came out in 2004. And what it does is that it keeps, it, I mean, it, the name is pretty, is pretty uh, sort of, it sort of describes pretty, pretty well what it does. It really accrues sort of knowledge. So it keeps history of all the harpy st 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 statistics. And it does that by, by first, so keeping, like aggregating the history and then processing it to make sense of that later. So it decouples monitoring from interp interpretation. And it has this, 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 this way of calculating what is called a phi value. That means that, it, that is the likelihood that a process is down. Again, there's nothing like black and white. We don't know for sure. But since it returns yet not yes or no or true or false, it, it returns a likelihood. Then we have actually more to work with. It might, it might be that we want to send messages off to, to, to I, mean, I mean, low priority messages off to, to something that has lower li or higher likelihood that is down. Uh, and and send, send more important messages off to something that is lower likelihood to be down and so on. And, and uh, yeah. And, and the way, the way sort of this, this is the math, by the way, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but, but it, it gives you a, sort, of, sort of this classic J curve. Uh, so when you, when you sort of plot it out. Another interesting uh, failure detector is the SWIM fail, failure de detector. And that, it has sort of, it's a lot of interesting things in the paper, but I think three things that stand, that stand out for me is that, it was one of the first one, I think, that sort of separated heartbeat from cluster de dissemination. It might, just, it might sound like a good idea, since you're already like gossiping or sending like state around, why not just make that your, your, your heartbeat, right? Then you save uh, the bandwidth, probably, right? But, but it actually turns out that that's, that's a pretty bad idea, because you, you, first you want, you, want, you, want like, you want to like tweak the, these differently. I mean, perhaps you have heartbeat more frequent than you actually have, have, have have state updates or so on. And also, uh, heartbeats can be like extremely really sm small in size, right? Just a few, a few bytes, while, while, while the vector clocks and all the state that it sort of represents can be actually grow quite big. So it's usually good, a good optimis optimization to do that. Another thing that they introduced was the concept of a quarantine. That, that means that if, if I suspect a process, I don't immediately m like mark it as down. Instead of putting it in this quarantine, say, you're suspected now, and there's a timeout that says that, that you're able to like, get out of the quarantine during. But if that passes, then OK, then you like, like set as being down and unreachable, or, or you, and you can't join the cluster again. Oops. So and the, the third thing, I think, is, what, is one of the more interesting things that, that they added. And that was something, I don't know if they called it. I call it del, del, de, delegated heartbeat. And it works the way that if I have like, Alice and Bob, two nodes here. And, and Alice wanted like check for Bob. She sends Bob, she, she sends Bob a heartbeat, say like ping, are you up? 
And if Bob uh, replies with an act, yeah, everything is fine. But if, if Bob doesn't reply within, within a specific timeout, then, then Alice just doesn't say that uh, Bob is down. I mean, he's now in quarantine. Instead, what she does is that she, she, she asks a friend, right, Lucy or whatever, could, with, like, sends a message to Lucy and says, could you go and check out Bob here? And Lucy, if, if then Lucy then comes back and says, yeah, Bob is up, then I know Bob is up and just the connection between us is temporarily down. Everything is fine. So you can do that by sending out like, could you check for Bob to like five different buddies? And hopefully someone will come back and say that Bob is up. If no one does it, then Bob is definitely down and he's, he's, uh, he's, he's moved off the cluster. So now I want to talk a little bit about strong consistency. It's essentially about linear, linearized ability. And, and th there are some important consensus protocols. And I think we can skip this. We're running a little bit out of time, the specification properties. So, so co consensus algorithms, in terms of strong consistency, I mean, so they implement C and A in, in, in CAP. So they sacrifice availability. That's important to know in favor of strong consistency. And some of the interesting ones that, that that sort of come up in order in time was first view stamp replication by Barbara Liskov and, and uh, I think it was her student, o something Oki. And, and it, it's, it's not that well known, even, well, even though it's, it was the first one that sort of came out, at least uh, uh, in this family. And it's, it's a lot simpler than Paxos that came out the, the year after, but there's still Paxos by Leslie Lampert has really been through the default uh, sort of standard. But Paxos is extremely hard to understand and it's also very, very hard to implement. It, it, I mean, if you look at the practical implementations of Paxos, usually it turns out they're actually deviated from the or, original paper just, just because it doesn't really work fully in practice. As soon as you deviate just a tiny bit, then you're left with an with unproven sort of specification. And you have to actually essentially prove it yourself to be sure, which, which most people don't do. They just try to test things. Yeah, and you never know what's going to happen then. So SAB stands for Atom Zookeeper Atomic Bro Broadcast. The only implementation of that that I know of is Zookeeper itself. Uh, and, and another very interesting thing is that came out, uh, like a paper that came out in like last, last year is Raft. And Raft is interesting because the idea behind Raft was that they, they wanted to do some, like take the other angle instead of you know, to try and come up with something really funky and really, really cool, I mean, really, really smart. They said, okay, well, how can we make a protocol that is understood, like human understandable? That's actually very approachable, probably to teach it to, to, to students initially, I guess. And, and uh, it turned out that actually, actually there is, it, is, it is a protocol that actually works very well in practice. That has a lot of similarities with view stamp rep, stamp rep, rep, replication. And it's really taken off. There are a lot of implementations in Raft now. And it, I encourage you to read the paper. It's very digestible, I think. So that's strong consistency. You can talk much more about strong consistency. Uh, I mean, you should read up a lot of interesting stuff that Peter, the Peter Bailey's group is doing, for example, as I say, highly available transactions or bolt-on consistency or some of the things that they're working on. But, I'm gonna, oh, but I, have, no, I don't have that much time, so I need to go, now go through it more quickly. Event, eventual consistency. You, you can't talk about that without mentioning Dynamo. Dynamo is like hugely, huge, hugely influential when it, when it comes to this. It sort of sparked off this whole trend of NoSQL no data, databases. And, it, and yet again, it sacrifices consistency for high availability, right? And, and it popularized a whole bunch of things. It's a very, very rich paper. It, it's, it popularized ev eventual consistency, as I, as I said, but also things like using the technique of epidemic gossiping, consistent hashing, things like, like we now almost take for granted when we, when we work with, like no, with NoSQL databases. Also things like hinted handoff, read, repair. I don't have time to go through all these, but I'm going to cover some of the, of the ones on top here. Uh, so epidemic gossip, for example. I think that's, that's a very powerful, very simple model. And we have also sort of embraced, sort of embraced in, 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 in ACA. Uh, the, the, I think the first reference to it, I think, is from the Cord, the, the cord paper, and later Pastry is another paper that came out, also, also sort of adopted this, this idea. But it's, it's, it's essentially, it lays out all nodes in the cluster in a, no, in a node ring, and, 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 sort of the, and there's like communication between all of them, so everyone knows everyone, right? 
And then it just starts to, to like gossip things in a fully probabilistic fashion. Epidemic is really, it's really, it's really good name because this sort of resembles really how, how like how, how, how viruses like spread in like in, in like biological sort of community. And and it it turns out that it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's it's a way to have clusters that converge and 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 reach consensus very very quickly. And, and it has a lot of other benefits, like it's completely decentralized. There's no like, special nodes or no leaders or anything. It doesn't have, and since it doesn't have that, it doesn't have a single point of failure and no single point of bottleneck. You can just scale this like, like crazy. So it, and it's also very, very, very elastic. And if you add like, consistent hashing to that, if you want to manage state across this, then you can like, partition it evenly and have in the consistency in the, in the consistent hashing algorithms allow you to easily add nodes and remove nodes adding to this elasticity story in, in a very very nice way it usually it doesn't require much administration either it just works so it's a, it's a very nice model and the way normally that that, that just sort of, sort of reach consensus is through vector clocks because that's the best way of sort of managing time and, and, and making sense of time uh, yeah, yeah yet, yet again, favors availability. So I have a lot more to talk about, I think, but, but I, I'm going to just spend the last minutes here just talking about how now Akka then, then uh, sort of uses some of these practices and how it's actually not how Akka cluster is, is sort of supposed to be used, more how it's implemented. And then you can go look it up how you should use it afterwards if you found that it made sense. So, but, 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 but first, Akka is a lot of things. Like, it's a, it's a toolbox like for a lot of things around, 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 around concurrency. But the, 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 so the most fundamental thing in, actors, uh, in Akka is actors. I think, as I said in the beginning, actors is a great model for modeling concurrency, distribution, and mobility, meaning the essence of the distributed systems. And, and it gives you one model to, to like think about these, regardless if you want to scale up meaning on multi-core or scale out on multiple machines. The, just having one, one way of doing things saves a lot of time. I mean, it saves a, like, saves a lot of thought process, a lot of this design, but also in terms of maintenance and, 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 how you, and how you take the system forward, I think. So actors is good. On top of that, we have, we have something called ARC-IO that implements there's a module that sort of implements low-level TCP, IP, um, I mean, UDP and these, 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 ty these type of things. On top of that, we've layered Akka Remote. Akka Remote essentially ensures that, that you have, that you have the, the, the full distribution, that you can actually, you know, with actors, you have these references to, to, to the actors. You have the decoupling between the actual thing that you as a client use and the running instance. Akka Remote makes it possible to actually, to, to actually have these have these, it implements sort of location transparency, you can see. So you have, have a ways to have, to have these instances actually running anywhere. So it, you re, it really gives you the full distribution. Akka cluster adds the mobility. So now we have concurrency, distribution, and, and mobility, like a full model for the distributed systems. And, and, and that's what I'm going to talk, talk about um, I mean, more, in, more, in, more, more in detail. Then on top of Akka, Akka cluster, which is sort of more, a little bit more low-level fabric, you can see we have a bunch of patterns. We call them extensions, like PubSub and Singleton and like anything you might want, right? So what is Akka cluster all about? Then? This is, so the, this is some of the features that, that you can expect to get, like cluster membership. I mean, is that nodes can come and come and go. They will join the cluster, they will leave the cluster. That all, all happen automatically, and there's a lot of algorithms that we implemented on top that take, that take advantage of that. But also, you can hook into that and getting callbacks whenever nodes leave and join, and where they're marked down, and, uh, and, 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 and so on. It also implements leader. It implements like something called singleton. We have cluster sharding. We have cluster routers, both that are ad ad adaptive, that sort of can learn how the application is being used. And, and allocate routes in the cluster on the nodes available uh, automatically. And also, when nodes leave or the, or the dynamics in the cluster change, they can like reallocate them. So here you have sort of the mobility that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. And cluster supervision it hooks into the failure de de detection to do like sort of sort of uh, best effort sort of fault tolerance across the cluster. So how does it work? Yeah, we, as I said, we rely, in Akka, we, we rely very much on the Dynamo paper here, like, like really masterless, fully decentralized, peer-to-peer. Peer. 
using epidemic gossiping, and we're using vector clocks. And, 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 and this gives us a model that's extremely elastic, I think, and it's also very scalable. I mean, in the last benchmark a year ago, we can probably rerun it now. I mean, we, we, we ran clusters about 2,400 nodes. And even, even, even more impressively, it actually converges extremely quickly, this type of model. So we, we were able to boot up 1,000 nodes in four minutes, have a fully joined cluster ready to go. That includes the virtual instances like on, on, on Google Compute Engine. So, so I thought that was pretty impressive. So when, when it comes to, to gossiping, this is the actual state that we, that, we, that we gossip around. It's a little simplification, but it's basically just taken out of ACA source code. So it, is, it is a CRDT, if you know what that is. But that, but that, sorry, but that doesn't matter. So for the, 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 the first field there is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a node ring. It is a sorted set, so we, 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 we sort them all, so every single node has the same view of what the node ring is and the ordering of the node ring. That is the member ring. Then we have something called the scene set. And that is what detects convergence. Convergence is a very important subject I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Yeah, I don't have that much time, so I need to hurry up. Then we have the unreachable set. That's where the failure detector puts, puts nodes that are like marked as unreachable. That's sort of the, the quarantine, you can say. And then we version this whole thing using a vector clock. Uh, so, so the way gossiping works is that one node picks a random node. Uh, with an, it actually checks if it has an older, in this, in, this, in this state, it actually checks, it actually first the favorite one that has an older and newer version. If, it does, if there's none, none exists, then it just picks a regular random, random node. Then it gossips it out in like fully request reply fashion. And then the receiving node then checks, do I have a new, like newer or an older or conflicting version of the state? If it has a conflicting, then it merges. And, and, and merges the vector clocks as well. If the newer, then the newer is, is kept, and then it, this sort of new gossip state now with upgraded version, it sends back. And then, and then the, so the whole process repeats itself, basically. So, so, so I say cluster convergence is extremely important, and, and that's essentially where we can determine that things are consistent. I mean, everyone is, agree is agreement on, 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 the, on the nodes in the node ring, who's up, who's down, and, 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 and so on. So we, can, we know that we have full convergence when all nodes are represent that are in the member ring are in the scene set, and there are no nodes in the unreachable set. The, the failure detector has marked none of the nodes down. And, and uh, we have some optimizations to this gossiping. For example, one thing is called biased gossip. That means that if we, like, we have an 80% bias to nodes not in the scene table, if we don't have convergence, then we check uh, who is actually not, who's like the laggards, right? And then we try to gossip to them. Another, another optimization is what we call push-pull gossip, and that is sort of a variation of it. We haven't implemented it all, all fully yet because we haven't had the real need, but, but the, it's a simple way of, of push-pull gossip in, in that we, if there is convergence, then we don't really, there's no really no need to like send this state around all the time. I mean, the, the, the full gossip state. Then we just send around the vector clock. And, and, and as soon as the node detects, the vector, I, have, I have a newer vector clock than the old one, then you know that, you're, you, that, you, that you don't have convergence any longer, and it goes back to regular like, go, go gossiping until it reaches convergence, and then it comes back to this. We have something called a leader. And this, is, this idea is like, it's like shamelessly stolen from, from Riak. In, in Riak, it's called the, clay, the, the claimant. So that was a great idea, I think. And, and the leader is really, that it doesn't violate the idea of having like fully decentralized cluster. It's, it's just a role that any, any, any node can have, and it doesn't perform like really heavy duty things. Essentially, well, the only thing it does is, is, is that it, 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 it sort of manages the, the, sort of the, the convergence. And, 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 and when it de de detects convergence, it has a, f a few, du few duties, and that is to move, I mean, you know, like, move like joining members to up, to move, to move exiting members to removed, and also to, to, to auto down members, which, which I'm going to talk about just in a second. So, Failure de detection is another interesting thing. So what we do is that we don't, in the, in, in, in the, in the failure detector, we don't just rely on the nodes in the, in the node ring, but we actually hash it to, to randomize the order. And that is because our failure detector just picks the next five 
to start gossiping to. And if we just pick the next five in the node ring, you know, then we have a less likelihood to actually bridge network, uh, bridge like racks and big and, and data centers and so on. Yeah. And, we, and we use this accrual failure detector. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but actually, in practice, it has proven to not be that, 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 that useful. Probably because GC often causes way longer latency sort of spikes than temporary network drops. So, so, so even though in an ideal world, we want to see, like, a, a plot cur the curve like this, we usually end up with something like this, especially if we run on EC2, right, where the latency is very unpredictable. This means that this small like, piece that, that actually the, the accrual, all the statistics gathering, the analysis is doing, like, is like outweighed from, from, this, uh, from, the, from this extra time out that we have to add to like, compensate for GC and these things. So that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, net, network partitions. Uh, I, I think it's, it's really important I mean, to, to, know how, to know how to deal with that. And, so, so a failure detector then can mark an, an unavailable member as unreachable. And, and as, as you know, when things are unreachable, when there's, least, like, when there's just maximum one in, in unreachable, in the unreachable set, then we can't have convergence. If, and if we can't have convergence, that means a leader can't p p perform his duties. That means that he can't, mark, he can't let nodes join the cluster or leave the cluster. This means that we have some, the classic split brain problem. There's really an, only one way out of that. I mean, either, well, in two ways. Either members can, within this timeout, come back from unreachable, like out of the quarantine, and then things are fine. But if that doesn't happen, then we need to mark a notice, mark a notice down. And, and, and that can either be done by the leader, by auto-downing downing him, like saying, you're down and we continue without you, or it's a manual process. And initially, we actually had the default to be auto-down, but it turned out to be to not work that well in practice, because, because I mean, if it's a network split, like 30 nodes there and 31 nodes here, I mean, should it down all of these 30 nodes? We actually might, might like take down the wrong one because you had really important services running in one part of the cluster and so on. So we actually moved, moved to manual down and now researching more advanced auto-down algorithms. So, yeah, can I, one minute to wrap up. So ACA modules for distribution that, that using this now, is, is, is uh, as I say, like the cluster singleton, for example, where cluster routers building on top of this, that takes full, full, full advantage of it, where cluster pub sub that builds on top of that as well. Cluster client, if you want to use this like, this like from the outside, we have also consistent hashing algorithms and things like that. So we, so we like starting to build up on this foundation of ACA cluster. And beyond, I don't have much time to talk about this, but the road ahead is that we, like HTTP, like it's a, it's a, it's a great way to build like REST services. It's also part of the, di of the di distributed story. Comes in ACA 2.4. Like a streams, it comes in ACA 2.4 as well. And then we're also working on, I started a project uh, called ACA C C C CRDT that Patrick Norval then took, took further. Now it's called ACA Data Replication. Uh, and that's kind of to be evaluated, so try it out, come with feedback. If, if, if it holds and it's useful, then it's going to be merged back in ACA. And so same thing, ACA Raft, that's a, that's a product by, by Conrad, a, a, guy, a guy in the, in the ACA team as well. If that also proves to, be, to hold, then we're going to merge it back, or uh, merge it into, into the core of ACA. So if you're eager for more, I, I encourage you to take a look at the ACA.io website, download it, play with it, and, and, and let us know if you find it, if, if, if you find it useful. Also, if you're interested in this type of things, like distributed systems and so on, join us at the React Conf. We have, I mean, Leslie Lamport is keynoting, Pat Helland is keynoting, two of my, my old time heroes. I'm really excited about that. And early bird uh, registration ends tomorrow. And if you really want to dig deep, I've added all references to all my, everything I've talked about here, and actually much more. So you can just go ahead and read all this if, you, if you're interested in this. <laughs> type of stuff. I really encourage you to do that. The so questions I'll take afterwards. I'll be here the whole day. So thank you for listening. Sorry for running over time. <laughs>